Hi guys, uh, oops, that's not it, sorry. Hi guys, as, oh, sorry, still showing you my web document. There we are, okay. Hey guys, Isaac here doing the final Thursday paper for this week. Uh, a data response paper, uh, 9708-41 from May June 2015. And it will follow the same format as we've been doing all week. Uh, my fans out there have been listening along to all of these, you'll know what this entails. So let's have a look through the article today. We'll do some live highlighting rather than me having highlighted already. So here we have an article talking about fuel shortage slowing India's economic growth. India has struggled to provide enough electricity to power its industry, we're told. Uh, so this is kind of the central point of the article. I'd kind of highlight that. We've got new power stations that have been built, but the country can't get enough fuel to run these power stations. You've got to build all these power stations, but they're pretty useless. Here we have the fact that about 55% of India's electricity is generated by the use of coal. It would be a key stat anywhere where we've got statistics and data important to make note of. India has one of the world's largest reserves of coal, but is not able to exploit it. The state-owned Coal India, which has monopoly control of 80%, we've got some nice figures. The production is required by government policy to sell coal at 70% discount below market price. So, big problem. There has been almost no investment, so no new investment, in coal production, either by the government or the private sector, who, according to industrials who struggle with the daily loss of electrical power. Coal production increased by 1%. So here we've got production increased by 1% in 2012, while electricity generating capacity increased by 11%. Some coal is imported, but this has now become very expensive as India's chief supplier, Indonesia, has doubled its price of coal. Attempts to open up and open new areas to mining have met with strong opposition from environmental regulators because it is claimed the development would destroy dense forests. Electricity, the electricity sector's problems have contributed to a second second year of decreasing economic growth for India, so they're in a recession. The growth rate was 10%, but only an estimated 7%. So here we go. <coughs> a complex system of price controls have resulted in retail electricity prices being lower than the cost of producing power, caused large losses at state-owned electrical electricity-generating industries. Businesses report that frequent losses of electrical power have forced them to lower production and spend significantly more on diesel fuel to run backup generators. It's important. Analysts say the reduced rate of economic growth could have been avoided if policymakers had addressed the problems of electrical shortage. These are the big problems. Weak infrastructure, restrictive regulation. The gap between demand and supply is shown here by Table 1. The increase, sorry, the gap between demand and supply. So the excess of electricity units demanded over unit supply. So clearly here we can see from the data that the excess of electricity units demanded has increased from 2010 to 2011. It's got 8.5 up to 10 and 12. So this is during peak and normal. So we can see that there's more, 8.5% more demand than supply there. <coughs> right. Let's talk through for section A. Section question 1A, which asks us to define uh, economic growth and identify two reasons for India's decreasing economic growth. Here it's important for us to talk about what we mean uh, by by economic growth here. Economic growth is an output, a shift in a rise in output or a shift in the production possibility curve. We're thinking about kind of structural increases in the economy's capacity to produce more goods, more services, etc. That's growth. And we want to elaborate on this saying it's kind of an increase in the real level of net national production. So how much we're actually producing. And what might indicate this? Well, things like an increase in GNP or GDP per capita. Now we want to give two reasons. Your reasons are all in the data here. We might think about uh, any of these three reasons here. Electricity shortage, weak infrastructure, restrictive regulations. Perhaps here also the opposition from environmentalists we're talking about up here. And perhaps even like just low production in general, for example. So here the low production, uh, no new investment maybe. And uh, India struggling to provide enough, enough electricity, like kind of the lack of electricity and lack of production of coal as well. Is so lots of reasons there you can use, nice and easy. Question B asks us to analyse whether the increase in electricity generating capacity in 2012 overcame the problems reported by businesses. So here we're talking about the problems repeated and reported by businesses. Well, businesses report frequent losses of electricity power forced into lower production and spend significantly more on diesel fuels to run backup generators. We've got a quote there. We can say, well, sorry, oh, accident. We're talking about what um, the problems reported by business and has increasing electricity capacity in 2012 done it? Well, it's clearly not only been overcome because our gaps increased. People are demanding more electricity and there's still not enough supply. 
So in, in peak hours, they demanded 9.8% more electricity than they actually had in 2011. 2011 and that's increased to 12.9% over 2011 2012 period. So clearly, these evidence figures from figure one demonstrate that uh, the problems haven't been overcome. Question C. Consider whether the above evidence about coal in India conflicts with the economic analysis of a monopoly. Well, what do we think about coal in India? Well, it talks about coal in India. Uh, where was coal in India gone? Here we go. State on coal in India, which has a monopoly control of 80%. Well, it clearly says it's a monopoly. It's got 80% of production. That's over 50%. It can be classed as a monopoly. Uh, pretty much controls it all. Uh, the monopolist, what would be the problems with, uh, are there other evidence from the analysis, sorry, is the fact that profits are high and price will be, uh, above the cost of production because monopolists can control output and is free to increase production investment if it wishes. So it can kind of increase production ever it wants and control price as much as it wants and produce as much as it wants. So it's very free. So coal India is class monopoly. And what's happened? Well, price controls, uh, here. Talking about uh, required by the government policy to sell coal at 17 production. So price controls have limited prices, profits and hence investment. So although coal India is technically a monopoly here, it's got 80% of production. It's not really a monopoly because it's controlled by the government where to price itself at. It's kind of a state owned monopoly. It cannot determine the price. And there is competition from foreign firms, but the price is too high and coal India can't compete. So the question here, considering what the evidence above about coal India conflicts with the economic analysis of monopoly suggests that it does conflict because it has 80 percent, but it should be a monopoly, but it clearly isn't. And it doesn't match with what we expect to see a monopolist um, demonstrating as kind of its characteristics in economic terms. Right, question D. Question D is asking us to use evidence from the information given to analyse whether the government policy towards coal India has been only disadvantageous to business into economic growth. So what is the government policy? Well, we've got inf- we need evidence from the information, but it says here at the top. The government policy is that the, the states own it, so it's it's kind of owned by the government and it's required to sell coal at 70% discount to market price. That's the policy. So has that caused problems? Well, it clearly results in an unprofitable situation. Uh, it says here. Where do we go? Uh, attempts to open new mining areas here, for example. So there's lack of investment in new mines and technology, despite massive coal reserves. That's what we're talking about here. Uh, production increased by 1%, so they're clearly not increasing that much. Uh, what else have we got? We've got this complex system in price controls, mean that they're lower, and the cost of producing power results in state losses, so they're not really investing, they're losing money. Uh, we're going to talk about the investment multiplier, and that's potential growth to reduce, because when you invest, your economic growth is expected to be greater than the initial rejection, so we're not really taking advantage of the uh, multiplier there. Another point would be that low prices encourage demand, uh, perhaps, is the kind of counterpoint there. So maybe it doesn't improve growth. That if, because the low price, people are demanding much more, there's much more kind of like people are able to use the electricity. And we see that from the excess demand over supply, that we've got a shortage. <coughs> and the problem is it's not met. So we have to import it. Imports are clearly expensive because Indonesia has doubled its prices. So that's another leakage from the economy causing growth. If prices were increased, we'd probably see this demand gap kind of shrinking. So uh, that's kind of the points about the problems. What's the counterpoint? Well, the evaluation you might want to use is here that the excess demand is because of these low prices. Because the price is completely kept low artificially, it might be the fact that uh, that's why we have the excess demand. And this might not be as detrimental as the increase in price would generate more spending and more injection into the economy. Uh, it might be not be bad because if they would increase the price, then you'd get more spending and then you'll get the economic growth and the multiplier effect. So though there are more disadvantages, there is some scope for evaluation there. So actually quite a simple part A here. Not really anything too complex, kind of supply demand analysis and a lot of use of the article and the data. So really important, as I suggest. And throughout that, kind of really focus on what we're to say. Right here. So now we're going to look at these seven questions, the the five, the six questions, sorry, two to two to seven, uh, where you can answer any two. And again, I'll just I'll just run through some of these concepts. You just give me two seconds. Grab. Right, so
don't like that. Like, it might, it might need to, to drink in order to speak uh, before that. So what are we looking at here? So question two is us is saying that international conferences uh, have been held to discuss the effects of global warming and to persuade governments to agree to improve efficiency in the use of resources by limiting the amount of harmful gases produced in their country. Explain what is meant by an efficient use of resources and discuss whether efficiency can only be achieved if public. What is this question? Well, you might get confused and people get put off by the beginning bit, but essentially what we're being asked is a purely definitional question at the beginning. Explain what is meant by an efficient use of resources. So we're going to talk about productive and allocative efficiency, as I've done many times before, including a few days ago, the paper. So we're going to distinguish between those two. And then we're going to discuss reasons for market failure and why the government needs to intervene. Because essentially the question is discuss whether efficiency can only be achieved with the government involved. So here we go. We've got, but we're going to frame it in the context of global war. So we're going to think about one way we might see pollution, uh, and why the government might need to get involved. Because efficient, the level of efficiency isn't achieved. We want a socially efficient, positively efficient position. We're going to have the analysis that's not achieved. So we'd use that analysis. What types of things might we talk about? Well, we might talk about we might talk about uh, things like uh, information asymmetries, externalities. Uh, you may even want to talk about merit goods and demerit goods a little bit. So goods that are overly providing the economy and goods that are under providing the economy. Various different factors here. And is the government really necessary in this case? So it might be some intervention is necessary in regulation. You can even say that it's only desirable in these cases of market failure when government intervention is done right. We might want to talk about efficient government intervention, things like patent quotas and then allowing companies to trade their emissions quotas. It's a policy often called tradable emissions quotas. You could also talk about other types, so like Peruvian taxes. So taxes on externalities are only really efficient if they're sized right. So it's really important to make sure we get the size of the tax correct in these cases. There's a lot of points here. That we're able to make. And it's important to me make uh, all, all the different points here uh, within, this, uh, within this question. Right, question three. Uh, with a perfect market and a given income, economic analysis explains how a rational consumer decides the quantities of which products to demand. It cannot, though, explain what happens when income changes, when incomes change, sorry, or when businesses and imperfect markets manipulate prices. Discuss whether you agree with this opinion about the economic analysis of uh, consumer behaviour. So this question is saying that, like, when we have perfect markets and given incomes, we're able to really understand how rational consumers decide. But we can't decide when incomes change when businesses and imperfect markets manipulate prices, how they're going to behave. So what kinds of things can we touch on here? Well, there's three aspects that we really need to consider. The first is we want to explain utility theory and consumer equilibrium. So in a perfect case, how does it work? So we want to talk about full on utility theory so that consumers uh, consume up to the point at which their marginal utility is below the price. So they consume every unit from which they get positive utility. And this is where we have the equilibrium. Uh, and that's consumer equilibrium. We'll talk about that. Point two we'd want to talk about would be we should consider whether the theory allows for any account to be taken of a change in income. And when, does that allow it? Well, what are some points you could make here? So if incomes go up, doesn't really explain utility. Perhaps in the sense that incomes go up means that consumers can afford more utility than they previously were. Um, but perhaps not as well. On the other hand, an evaluation point is the fact that when we increase incomes, we don't really talk about individuals' irrational behaviour. So that when you get increased incomes, you might want to increase your consumption of conspicuous goods like Ferraris, etc. So those aren't really predicting the utility function, that your utility for goods changes as your income increases. Uh, the second stage we want to talk about is the existence of imperfect markets and price fixing might be included in the theory. So imperfect markets, no, these kind of pros are problem for utility theory. And perhaps consumer equilibrium and uh, uh, kind of uh, utility theory don't really work in these cases because firms don't act in, in consumers don't react necessarily in rational ways to imperfect markets and price fixing. So how can they be included? We then really want to consider thirdly whether the argument is correct. So is it the case that economic analysis consumer behavior doesn't work uh, when incomes change or when business change? And that's kind of the crux of the argument. And that you'd have to come down on either side. It's quite a complicated question, one that's probably better 
for you guys to have a go at, I'd recommend, just because I can explain kind of various different things, but be there for about an hour. So if you want to have this, jot down some notes and then send me some messages or we'll talk about it. Uh, I don't know if I'm doing a live session this week. I'm just going to talk about it. And then we'd um, have a better chance to discuss it. Perhaps Friday is when we'd go to our live session. Right, looking at question four, making good headway through this paper. 4A, how does economic analysis explain the level of wage rates in a perfectly competitive labour market? So, if we have a perfect competitive labour market, we're thinking we're going to focus on a uh, marginal uh, rev- uh, the marginal rate of productivity. So we're going to think each consumer, each worker added, you could do this by demand and supply analysis. So I'll make that clear. You can just talk about demand for labour, supply of labour, and really think about kind of just that. But that's not going to score you as highly as an approach that focuses on the marginal rate of productivity and also marginal utility theory. So let's start with one side. Let's think about the demand side of the economy. How much will be demanded in a perfect um Perfect, uh, perfectly competitive labour market. Well, what will be demanded is firms will want labour up until the point in which, which the marginal rate of productivity, so each additional worker's kind of added value to the firm, is equal to is greater than or equal to the wage they they make. Otherwise, you're paying them more than they're adding value, and that's not efficient. So that's the one side. That's demand, and you'll kind of explain what you mean by marginal rate of productivity. You'll give a definition of that. You'll give a definition of why, ex- explanation of why firms would only demand labour up until the point at which the marginal rate of productivity is, uh, equal to the wage and, and they demand every unit where it's greater than the wage. On the other side, we then talk about supply and we talk about the marginal utility trade-off that's going to go on there. Well, the worker's going to engage in a version of marginal utility analysis and they're going to say, well, the marginal utility of me giving an extra hour of work or taking the job and losing an hour of leisure uh, has to be equal to my wage. So the the wage has to be able to compensate sufficiently the worker for losing their leisure time and taking on a job. So those are the two sides to minus supply. So you can see quite clearly how by using pro- marginal rates of productivity and marginal utility theory, we're able to add that top level analysis to a simple demand and supply approach to why how wage rates in a perfectly competitive industry uh, drive demand and supply for labour. And what we're going to show there is that the equilibrium wage rate is going to be determined by these, these, these two considerations there. 4B gives us two press statements. First press statement of government announced that it would limit top level pay for senior executives. So here we're talking about limiting the top level pay by imposing a maximum wage so people can only be paid so much. <coughs> and the trade union with transport workers decided to call a strike unless its members were awarded more money. So discuss how economic analysis of wage determination will be changed by the announcement of the government and the decision of trade So we've just done some economic analysis about wage rates in perfectly competitive labour markets, and now I'm going to analyse how this changes. So let's look at the first one. So the first one, uh, here we prefer, well, let's just sum up this first. First, previously in 4A, we talk about perfectly competitive labour markets. In part B, we have two examples of imperfect labour markets, and they're actually exactly the same as the imperfect labour markets we talked about on Tuesday. Repeat concepts coming up again. This is very what this is why working off past papers is so important. Keep bringing up the same concept. We've got the two types of imperfect competition we talk about. So on the first side, this is going to be an issue for supply, right? They're both supply issues. So here, the government announced they would limit top level pay for senior executives in industries by imposing maximum wage. What's that going to do? So the supply is going to be really different there because we're changing the way in which workers view their time, we might not be paying them enough in order for them to compensate their time and workers are top executive, they might just retire or something like that. So we're going to lose some people at the labour force and the marginal rate of productivity isn't going to determine the price anymore, it's going to be uh, the maximum wage. On the second side, uh, we're going to talk about the trade union and how this represents kind of a unfair market power in the side of trade union, the trade union has control over most of the transport workers and they're going to not go to work unless they're paid more. So this is an example of demand for labour is having to kind of accept that they might have to pay a higher price. In this case, what's happening is supply of labour has become really basically elastic, right? Any change in wage below what they deem to be an acceptable level is going to mean that there's actually no workers going to work. They're going on strike. 
So it's basically perfectly elastic the world almost here, and that's something you can talk about. What are we talking here? So what's going to, what are we going to use to evaluate? This is always important on these questions. How do we evaluate? Well, the point we're going to make is it also depends how high this maximum price is. The effect on supply and demand is really, really going to depend on how high this maximum wage is. Maximum wage is six million a year. Very few people are affected, so we're not likely to see that much change in demand supply. If the increase in higher rate, the higher rate of payment the trade union wants is ridiculously high, their workers are saying they want their workers to be paid 500,000 a year, which is insane, then we're probably not going to see that much change in demand and supply. And we're always going to depend on the kind of like magnitude of the decision. So that's a really important way of thinking about analysis. Can we evaluate this in terms of the magnitude? Right. Question five. We've got explain why manufacturers differentiate their products and describe the characteristics of two market structures where product differentiation works. So what is different? It's quite actually a nice question. What is differentiation? Differentiation is where firms act in a way that makes their products seem different from each other so that consumers might want one over the other. There are some really classic ways of differentiation, things like branding. Realistically, there's not much difference between Pepsi and Coke. But the branding is different. Or a better example would be something like Coke Zero and Diet Coke. It's a famous story. Coke Zero and Diet Coke are essentially the same product, but Coke Zero doesn't have the word diet in it. So perhaps differentiating in that respect means that, and the reason they did that was they thought that Coke and Diet Coke didn't appeal to a male market because they didn't want to be seen to be drinking a diet drink. And in fact, they'd rather have Coke Zero to sell more man. That might be product differentiation, a great example of product differentiation. That's fair. Other ways of doing it is by advertising by brand names. So you might have like Nivea for men, Nivea for women, etc. that kind of uh, differentiation. And why do they do it? Well, the reason is it's to one, increase profit. So people are more, you're going to increase your demand. People are more likely to buy your product to support differentiation from another product in the market. And you're also going to increase consumer loyalty because if you can convince consumers that there's something special about the good or service they're consuming off you, then they're going to keep coming back. So if you can persuade them that there's something fundamentally different between Coke and Coke Zero, Coke Zero and Diet Coke, they might continue to buy Diet Coke of the other. Or if a better example, because Coke is the same company. If you're Starbucks, you can differentiate your product based on kind of having a slightly nicer coffee cup that gives it a more elite brand. And consumers might go to Starbucks more because they like the coffee cup. So you kind of build that loyalty in there by differentiating. What are two market structures that uh, kind of incentivize uh, product differentiation? Well, not perfect competition, because perfect competition famously has... Um, uh, homogenous products, products are all the same in perfect competition, but any of the others have a degree of product differentiation. You could talk about, describe monopolistic competition, oligopoly and monopoly, any of those two would get you the market in this context. Moving on to part B here, so part B is asking us to analyse and consider the extent of the link between marginal cost, diminishing returns and economies of scale. So the first part of this question is always going to be to define so we're going to think about what we mean when we say marginal cost, the cost of the next unit produced or the next unit bought. Diminishing returns is where as, some, as you move forward, either in amount of capital put in or amount of labor hired or amount of product bought, you get diminishing returns. You get less of what you were trying to get. So if you buy the amount of utility, for example, you might get from buying the first apple, it's probably going to diminish as you get towards the third, fourth, fifth, a hundredth apple you buy, you're not really going to care about that hundredth apple, the utility you get from it is diminished by the fact you've got so many already. What do we mean by economies of scale? Well, economies of scale are cost reductions that occur when, um, sorry, economies of scale are uh, cost reductions that occur when you get, when you get an uh, increased amount of production, you might see lower costs. So what we want to do now is we want to link these three things together. We want to analyze the link. So there are three links uh, to discuss when we think about marginal costs. There are three links to discuss here, sorry. Marginal cost to diminishing returns, marginal cost to economies of scale, and then diminishing returns to economies of scale. So let's think about them each in turn. There's clearly a link in the short run between marginal cost and marginal product, and thus to diminishing marginal returns. So marginal cost, uh, as it increases, uh, you get low, you get lower marginal productivity, and therefore you get diminishing marginal returns. So that's a very clear short run link. And the notion of diminishing marginal returns is inherently linked to these concepts of marginal cost and marginal product. 
What do you think about the next thing? Well, there's only an in, actually an indirect link between diminishing returns in the short run and economies of scale in the long run. If you have diminishing returns in the short run, uh, if you increase your size, eventually in the long run, you might likely see uh, economies of scale because of this long run aggregate cost curve that's in play. And these are important to kind of get your head around these different curves. Theoretically, you could kind of argue that there's this long run marginal cost. Uh, but it's not really likely to link to directly link to economies of scale. And the short run marginal cost is definitely not linked to economies of scale. So on that basis, there's a, there's a little bit more tricky to link them. So you kind of just want to basically very systematically go through these different linkages and think about the ways that they kind of interplay as concepts. 6A, in 2013, a new aircraft, the Boeing 787 Dreamliner, was assembled in the United States. United Airlines, an American private company, ordered 50 of these aircraft, each costing over US $200 million. So what do we see here? Well, here we imagine that the US was a closed economy with no government intervention, right? So the US has no government, it's basically just got consumption and investment. There's no government and there's no trade. Why the increase in national income from this investment in new aircraft might be different if it were an open mixed economy. So now we're thinking why it might be, there might be, so now we've introduced the fact that there might be difference um, between having some degree of government spending and also having trade. So we want to think about the multiplier, right? We want to think about the link between investment and national income, recognizing that in the first case, there'd be no leakages to taxes and imports in a closed economy. However, in the link, in, in the open economy, taxes are going to take some money out and they might, the proportion of taxes <coughs> spent might be higher than the proportion of private income spent and therefore you're going to get a leakage. In the same case, in imports, you might have a leakage in the external economy. So that's how the difference would occur. In the first case, you'll have no leakages out because you don't have any taxes, you don't have any uh, imports. So you don't get any leakages and you just get the direct multiplier effect from investment. And in the second case, you might have those leakages. So quite simple analysis there. Question B, discuss the policies the government might wish to use to influence the level of investment in the economy. And here, there are loads of ways of doing it. Government policy is a massive field. So we want to think about a way to structure this question. And a really good way to structure it would be to think about fiscal policy first and then monetary policy. So when we talk about fiscal policy, we talk about government increases in spending or changes in tax rates. And we talk about monetary policy, we talk about interest rates. So let's think about fiscal policy first. Well, the government might want to cut business taxes. They might want to cut taxes on individual spending so more people go on holiday. And it's more kind of like... Um, it will increase the level of investment so people are kind of like buying more products and people can invest. We want to maybe cut business taxes so they have more money to invest. Um, what else might we do? We might want to increase government spending on investment projects or in training of, of, of workers so that people want to invest in the economy, increase global competitiveness, etc. Cetera, et cetera. So we've got the kind of increase in spending and lower taxes. Clearly, expansion of fiscal policy might influence the level of investment. Remember to keep focusing back when you suggest the policy. These specifics, so you might talk, instead of just talking about cutting taxes, you might talk about cutting the rate of business tax, or cutting the rate of corporation tax, or cutting the rate of capital gains tax, that's taxes on income that's generated investments, which means that people get to keep more of the money they make from an investment, so they're going to clearly invest more. Let's think about the monetary policy side. So monetary policy is interest rates. We want to get more people investing, and what is people tax to investment? Well, they need to borrow money for that. It's going to be this loanable fund. What you want to do, you want to reduce the cost of borrowing, and that's clearly a lowering of interest rates. So by lowering interest rates, we're going to um, increase the try to incentivize the level of investment in the economy. Uh, what else might they want to do? Well, they might want to uh, do it by regulation. They might want to deregulate some of the business stuff in terms of financial sector. So we've talked about taxes and subsidies. I mean, talk about subsidies, but subsidies are an option you could talk about. Can you subsidize investment? We've talked about the interest rates, and we've also talked about these regulations. Now, how would you want to evaluate this question? Well, we'd want to evaluate the different mechanisms with you. What's the problem with using fiscal spending, government spending? Well, it costs a lot. Eventually, you're going to have to either borrow this money or raise taxes and the people pay for it. What are the problems with cutting taxes? Well, it's the same problem. If you don't change your government spending, you're now going to create a budget deficit, increase the national debt, et cetera, et cetera. What about using interest rates? Well, interest rates, might you might get some degree of crowding out. Sorry, if you use the fiscal side as well, you might want to talk about crowding out. What's the problem with the interest rates? Well, interest rates have a time lag. Things are immediate. The banks might not have confidence in the economy, so they might not lend at the rate when interest rates are lowered. They might not lower their interest rates either. They might want to mitigate risk, etc. So those are all considerations to use as to whether these are actually effective. And then finally, question seven. 
Seven A, we have a, in 2012, a table for gross GDP per head showed that only three of the world's 10 richest countries have population above 7 million. The US, United Arab Emirates, and Switzerland. So the 10 richest countries, the 10 richest, only 10 richest countries in the world, only uh, three had a population above 7 million. So all the richest countries in the world by GDP per head uh, measured are uh, really small, are really big, are bigger countries. Why? So one, one, we want to explain how GDP is calculated and then show why GDP at market price is different from net national income at factor prices. There's three main ways of calculating GDP. One, by the expenditure, mesh, expenditure mesh, uh, measure. We look at the value of goods and services produced in a country in a given time period, normally a year, and then we divide it by the number of people. No, sorry, we're not talking about GDP per capita, we just talk about GDP in this question. First part, the, the extra prompt for the question talks about GDP per capita or per head. The second way of measuring GDP is using net national income. We look at the sum of the incomes to the factors, including incomes earned abroad. So we're looking at all the income in the economy. And then we're going to um, kind of measure that. There's two ways of doing that. One, we might look at factor costs plus taxes minus subsidies. So that's market prices. And then we might look at gross domestic products, so GDP um, at market price. Uh, 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 sorry, and then GDP, this gross domestic product, the first case, factor costs plus taxes minus subsidies. Minus the depreciation, so in, in, so taking account of the kind of inflation in the economy, um, is going to give you the net. So what are we thinking about in B? The classification is often distinguished between developed rich countries and developing poor countries. Consider in what ways developing countries said to be poor, and discuss whether the best way to become developed would be to reduce the size of the population. So let's think about first, there's three, sorry, three main parts of this question again. One, they wanted to think, what do we think about when we say a developing country is poor? So what sense of developing country well, it has bad levels of infrastructure, maybe poor healthcare, maybe poor education, maybe low average income, people don't earn very much, maybe there's poor sanitation, maybe there's bad governance, all these different things. Basically, think about why countries and what, what it means for a country to be poor. It should be a pretty simple explanation. You probably want to give two or three factors there. So now we want to think about two reasons why countries might be poor. Because here we're talking about whether the best way to become rich is to get rid of some of this population. Well, that would work if the reason that these countries are poor is because they don't have very much of healthcare or education and stuff, and there's a lot of people in the country. If you had education, but you couldn't give it to everyone, or if you had healthcare, you couldn't give it to everyone, then that would be an explanation as to why reducing the size of the population might help poor countries become rich. However, this is not really the case, and you can kind of see that it's not the main problem they face. There are poor countries in the world that are very small and poor countries in the world that are very rich. Simply, the problem they have is that they, they're not very good at having education. They come from problems with geography, problems with environment, problems with history. Um, various different factors mean countries are poor, but it's generally not because of the size of their population. And they need to change the structural problems in their economy and the systemic problem, the problems in the systems they have, the systemic problems in education, healthcare, sanitation, etc. Uh, more so than the size of their population. And therefore, we can conclude, and you have to come to a conclusion here because we've got this keyword discuss, we're going to conclude that reducing the size of the population is therefore not necessary. That brings us to the end of the paper. I hope that was helpful. It was just a quick run through. Remember to please send me any questions that you have. You've been very good at that so far. Uh, sorry, I've brought up my document of women's rights and human's rights. Um, I hope that was helpful. And... Uh, yeah, drop me any questions and I'm sure we'll post about the live session tomorrow if it's going ahead tomorrow or most likely on Friday if it's going ahead. Thanks guys.